Today, we're talking to an NBA star and an NFL insider on the nuances of their lives and some of the big stories in each of those leagues. Plus, local media in baseball has been upended once again in a move that could lead to some long-term changes. Also, Michael Jordan is suing NASCAR and NIL is coming to high school. It's Thursday, October 3rd. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we're talking to DeMontis Sabonis, one of the stars featured on Netflix's docuseries Starting Five. We're also chatting with Fox Sports NFL insider Jordan Schultz on the exhausting insider life and some of the big stories of that league. Our own Eric Fisher joins to break down a major development in how MLB teams are broadcast, and we'll check in on the latest in college football and MJ's antitrust lawsuit. First, let's hit some headlines. Start with baseball. Diamond Sports Group, the now bankrupt operator of Valley Sports, said it will stop broadcasting 11 of the 12 teams it televised this past season in 2025. Seven of the 11 teams, the Cincinnati Reds, Detroit Tigers, Kansas City Royals, Los Angeles Angels, Miami Marlins, St. Louis Cardinals, and Tampa Bay Rays, were under contract with Diamond through 2025. These teams will either have to negotiate a new deal with Diamond or find a new operator to televise them next season. The other four teams, Cleveland Guardians, Milwaukee Brewers, Minnesota Twins, and Texas Rangers, had deals that expired at the end of the season. Only the Atlanta Braves currently have a deal in place with Diamond for the 2025 season. We'll have more on this later with our newsletter writer, Eric Fisher. Elsewhere in the league, ownership of Shohei Otani's 50th home run ball has gotten quite complicated, as two separate fans have filed lawsuits claiming possession of the ball. Max Mattis originally filed a lawsuit claiming that he originally caught Otani's historic home run ball that made him the first 50-50 player in MLB history. Joseph Davidoff, who left the stadium with the ball, filed the second suit claiming ownership. Mattis alleged that he initially caught the ball, but Davidoff pinned his arms between his legs and wrestled the ball from his hands. Davidoff has claimed that he, quote, firmly and completely grabbed the ball in his left hand while it was on the ground, successfully obtaining possession of the 50-50 ball. Maybe the two of them should just split it 50-50. The NFL suspended Buffalo Bills star defensive end Von Miller for four games due to personal conduct violations. The suspension appears to stem from allegations of domestic assault dating back to November of last year. Cleveland Browns rookie defensive tackle Mike Hall Jr. was also suspended by the league for personal conduct violations. Hall's five-game suspension also stems from a domestic assault allegation earlier this summer. The allegations against the players are quite serious and could ultimately result in more than just an NFL suspension. To the college game, Texas State has ended discussions to leave the Sun Belt Conference for the Mountain West. The Bobcats had received an offer from the Mountain West after winning their first bowl game as an FBS school in 2023. Texas State's exit fee from the Sun Belt Conference would have cost them $5 million. And in basketball news, Brittany Griner is officially the 24th player to join Unrivaled Basketball. The upcoming 3-on-3 league already features stars like Enrique Ongumbawale, Kelsey Plum, Angel Reese, and even UConn star Paige Beckers. The league is expected to have 30 total players and is set to launch in January, giving WNBA players an alternative to overseas basketball during the offseason. Up next, DeMontis Sabonis has become a fixture with the Sacramento Kings. He is also one of five players featured in the Netflix docuseries Starting Five, along with LeBron James, Jason Tatum, Anthony Edwards, and Jimmy Butler. We spoke about what it's like having a camera follow you everywhere and his thoughts on the in-season tournament and other big changes the league has made. That conversation is coming up next. Very excited to be joined now by DeMontis Sabonis of the Sacramento Kings. Welcome, DeMontis. What's up, guys? Thank you for having me. Great to have you on. So you're one of five NBA stars in the new Netflix show, Starting Five. What was it like having a camera follow you around, you know, off the court and everywhere else you go? Uh, Wow. It was definitely, definitely different. Definitely different. You don't expect the camera to be so on you as much. You you basically can't. You don't know what's coming until you experience it. You wake up, there's a camera on our face. You're trying to go to the bathroom. They're trying to follow you in. Um, any off days, we're going to do family things. You know, you got to figure for six, seven other people with cameras following you, you know? So um, it's uh, it was very different, but Netflix did a great job. The camera crew was 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 amazing. Yeah. And were the those lines around where they follow you and where they can't, was that all just figured out in the contract ahead of time? Or is there some like real-time negotiations of like, hey, could you guys yeah. not you know watch us like having this like fight with our kids or something yeah uh no we were very open and easy you know we just we got two kids you know we're 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 all about our kids you know so we're a mom and dad duty so it's all very natural we're we're we were i think we were super open so whatever you want you can take you know um and yeah it was just having every second you look around there's cameras everywhere so you know um the good thing was the kids got used to the crew you know we had the same crew for 90 percent of the time and um we kind of felt like a little family bond. 
Yeah. Was it over the whole season or like how long was this like relationship you had with, with oh, Netflix? It was, it was the whole season. It was the whole season before training camp all the way till every player's last game in, in the NBA. So yeah, it was a long mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Well, um, are there gaps? The I mean, obviously there are gaps between what the average fan knows and understands about the NBA and your lives as players. Um, I mean, not just gaps, but like misunderstandings that you think are going to get filled in by this show. For sure. For sure. I feel like um, we all know players by what how they are on the court. We experience as players. You might not like this player. And then he comes on your team and you're like, oh, wow, this guy's awesome. You know, like <laughs> rock with him. So the same thing on a show, you know, you only see so much on people's social. And this is actually giving you a real deep behind the scenes look, you know, um, of what players do on their off days, how they, what they sacrifice, what they do to take care of their bodies. And, you know, it's just on another level where they're filming it 24 seven. So like, you're going to see that from every single player. So I think that's going to be really cool for the fans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, of course the NBA has, you know, helmets, you can see the players and also there's almost no space between the court and the fans and the cameras. Do you feel like we already know you better than, you know, say like an F1 driver or, um, you know, even in like golf, you know, things are kind of like feel a little bit removed. Um, do, do you think there's like already some like intimacy there or is it just like you're a different guy on the court? Uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, basketball players definitely get some more exposure because we're not covering our face. Um, I don't know, maybe me not personally, but <laughs> definitely other, <laughs> other players, um, they know them a lot more than other sports for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so obviously the NBA has got this massive new media deal, you know, $76 billion uh, coming in, almost triple what the league was getting before. Is this something that like is a topic among the players? Um, to be honest, I mean, at least not, not in our uh, locker room, you know, everyone's kind of just doing their thing, you know, focusing on the team. Um, maybe it's different. No, on, on our team, everyone kind of is locked in for, for, for long term. So it hasn't really been a, a thing mm -hmm. everyone just knows like oh this new tv deal this new tv deal it's been hearing that yeah. for years so now it's finally done so i mean uh, it's it's definitely exciting and great for the league yeah and yeah maybe on your end it'll be more like when that deal kicks in and the salary cap is probably going to go up 10 percent per year for a long time and then you're going to start seeing crazy deals i mean the deals are sort of crazy <laughs> compared to what they were five ten years ago and we're we're going to have that again like yeah. for the next decade Obviously, to kind of lead up to that and also just to, you know, maybe improve the product on the the court, NBA had some, you know, some pretty substantial changes, like the new load management rules. We've got the in-season tournament now. Do you feel like the league and the players are enough on the same page when it comes to uh, instituting those changes? I think so, for sure. You know, um, the league mentions everything to us before they do a final decision. They got, you know, they ask for our approval. Everyone votes. Everyone in the NBA has a chance to vote for what they want, and it's overall um, a little survey. So they do a great job, you know, and, um, we feel that m mutual respect from them. Mm -hmm. And the play in tournament has been around long enough to feel like we're used to it maybe, but you know, you, the Kings were in the, the tournament this past season. Um, what are your thoughts on having that as like a way to sort of divide the teams one more time between playoff and non-playoff? Uh, I love it. I, w I wish it, I wish it came to the league earlier, you know, I mean, it's a great way to get games more competitive, Especially this year, I feel like every team that maybe didn't take it as serious last year is definitely going to go all in this year. And it's fun. You know, you get more exposure. These games are highlighted. You know, they're on TV. If you make the Final Four in Vegas, you know, everyone's watching. This is the closest thing to an Eastern Conference champion or a, or a finals, you know, it's championship. You know, like everyone's going to be watching these games. So I think it's great for the organizations that make it, the teams that make it, just everything involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you feel like things are kind of settled for now? Obviously, you know, a few changes over the last few years, but is this the NBA we saw last year? Is that just going to be the NBA we see uh, going forward? Knowing the NBA, I feel like there's going to be there's going to be new things all the time. You know, they're always trying to expand, make yeah. new things. You know, so who knows what can happen from more teams or changing All Star games and stuff like that. You know, right, right, yeah. I guess the All Star game is still kind of wet clay. I think it's still there. I mean, Maybe yeah. some more I mean, experiments. I mean, I've there. been a part of the league for eight years, and there's already like four or five things that have changed since I've been here. So yeah, right, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot. Uh, and actually, one one of those could be new teams. Um, what would you think about the NBA adding, you know, potentially two teams in the next few years? 
uh, I think it would be amazing. You know, I mean, the teams, the cities they talk about, the team they talk about, you know, you know, I think it would just make the NBA a lot more fun, you know, more opportunity for other players and uh, athletes uh, to play in this league. Mm -hmm. And any cities you'd be particularly excited about? I, you know, I went to Gonzaga, so Seattle would be a really oh, cool nice. one to, to get their team back, you know, and then I don't know who else is on the list. Was it was it Vegas and some other city? Vegas, Mexico City gets mentioned Mexico sometimes. City, yeah, um, yeah. yeah uh, other spots too. But but yeah, I mean, I think those are the top two or three. Seattle, I think, has to get a team. It's yeah. It would just kind of be wrong, I think, to not, <laughs> not give them their team back. Um, um, in, in terms of, um, you know, getting back to, to the show, uh, you know, if I imagine it'll be a success, I imagine they'll be doing a season two. Or who do you think would be a good target in terms of players to to you know get to know them a little better? I have no idea. You know, uh, <laughs> I have no idea. I feel like um, everyone has such a different personality and lifestyle that no matter who they choose, um, it's going to be a great thing. You know, you get such a such a big dive behind behind the scene curtains that. Um, it's it's really interesting you know me as a player i know these guys and i'm like oh wow you know like this is this is really cool so um as 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 a fan i think it's it's going to go off mhm mm yeah and so yeah the other four are lebron anthony edwards jason tatum and jimmy butler did you um were you getting to know them a little bit better through the process of doing the show uh yeah of course you know um you you basically know like what they're filming what they're doing you know um you get to see um we saw it yesterday the first two episodes so like just by watching that experience you really deep dive and know more about their families and their stories and everything where you might think you might have known before but this is a whole different view because they're talking families talking friends are talking and um it's really cool yeah who are you most surprised by in terms of like what you know about that player and what you learned uh i mean every single one has a <laughs> has, has a lot that you thought you knew about or there's one that you knew like, oh, I know the guy pretty well. And then you watch the show and you're like, oh, wow, there's a whole other side that that is new mm -hmm. and exciting. Yeah. Um, you know, we just had the Olympics this summer, which was, um, you know, sort of the rare chance for NBA players to represent their country. I'm also thinking about uh, the Unrivaled League. You know, the WN WNBA players are starting this this winter league. Uh, it'll be three on three. It's kind of its own thing. Makes me wonder if obviously your teams would probably have a thing or two to say about this, but just. Um, if you think there's room for more, more basketball, uh, you know, with the top talent in the world, more basketball, oh, uh, <laughs> or, is it, or is you got with, enough already with, with the guys in the league. No, I don't, I don't know if there's room for more basketball. Um, everyone loves to play, but uh, mm -hmm. a lot of guys love getting better. I feel like the league is so good the way it is yep. because they give us time to recover and really work on our craft and improve the game. And that allows us to perform at the highest level for the 82 games and put on a show. Right. So yeah. I, I feel like they figured out that balance perfectly, you know, and that's why it's been so successful. Yeah. Yeah. And I should say it's a little bit apples and oranges with the WNBA because their season is half as long. Um, is there, um, as the WNBA also becomes more and more prominent, especially, you know, with this, this media deal being the best evidence you could find for that, um, as well as the sellout crowds. Um, do, do you feel like there's just kind of more cross pollination and more opportunities to work with that league? Oh, yeah, of course. You know, I mean, we've seen it in the last couple of years already how it's how it's grown and the things, you know, we do as the players um, with, with the league and the, and the WNBA and just supporting them going to their games. You know, um, it's it's been a lot of fun. It's been very exciting seeing it grow and just seeing, you know, um, these athletes are, are amazing. You know, they're amazing athletes and they they deserve their their spotlight. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, you know, just how the league is, is presented and, and maybe just the, the game itself, are there any things you're excited about that are coming up or just things you'd like to see, um, in terms of, yeah, just the NBA as a product, the NBA, I'm just excited for the season, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in the West coast conference, you know, it's tough. It's yeah. tough and they just got tougher, <laughs> you know, more talent, <laughs> more players, guys are getting older, you know, teams might, there might be surprises and, you know, it's going to be super competitive. Everyone's going to take the in-season tournament even more serious. So like those games count to our regular season um, um, record too. So I'm excited. I think it's going to be the best year yet. Yeah. Cool. And, and I mean, you're already getting into it, but uh, yeah. What are you most excited about as the season approaches? Uh, just getting on the court, you know, I miss playing basketball games. I miss being in front of the fans, you know, the Kings fans are, on fire every game uh, i miss that feeling you know you want to get out there and compete all right we'll leave it there demonte sabonis really appreciate your time thanks for joining us on the show thank you thank you for having me appreciate it
PJ Tour Commissioner Jay Monahan is playing in a golf tournament. He is participating in the Dunhill Links Championship, which starts today. It's a nice wide open event where people come in with a partner and then are paired with one other group of two. Rory McIlroy, for instance, is playing with his father. Monahan is playing with PGA Tour golfer Billy Horschel, and the two of them are paired with Yasser El Rumian, the governor of the Public Investment Fund, which backs Live Golf. El Rumian is playing with Dean Burmester, who is one of 14 Live golfers in the tournament. It has now been 16 months since the PGA Tour and PIF agreed to come together on some kind of deal, but it's been crickets from them since then. There's a double imbalance with the PIF having absurd levels of funding and the PGA still being very much the center of the golf universe despite Live Golf's best efforts. So far, these interlocking puzzle pieces have not interlocked, and it's not clear if they ever will. But hey, they say the golf course is a good place to strike a deal. To another disputed deal, three decades ago, Michael Jordan shifted the balance of power in the NBA. Now he's trying to do the same thing in NASCAR. Jordan's 2311 Racing and Front Row Motorsports have filed an antitrust lawsuit against NASCAR and the France family, which owns the series. The dispute comes from NASCAR's most recent charter deals with its 15 teams. These deals determine revenue sharing and other core elements, and they were signed by every team except for the two plaintiffs in the suit. The lawsuit, which has been obtained by Front Office Sports, called NASCAR and the France family monopolistic bullies. Quote, bullies will continue to impose their will to hurt others until their targets stand up and refuse to be victims. That moment has now arrived. Once you get past the tough talk, the suit strikes at the heart of NASCAR's business model, saying that it prevents competition by binding teams to its series, racetracks, and suppliers. If this one is successful, it could radically change how NASCAR does business. To college sports, Alabama's 41-34 win over Georgia averaged 12 million viewers, making it the most watched regular season college football game since 2017. That's also higher than the average viewership for the most recent World Series, NBA Finals, and NHL Finals. Yes, it's not fair to compare one game to a five or seven game average, but we're also talking about a week five game against a championship series. The game also did wonders for the brand value of Crimson Tide freshman receiver Ryan Williams. By on three's valuations, Williams doubled his NIL value in that game to $1.5 million, giving him the 14th highest brand value of all college athletes. And soon, on three might need a new type of list because NIL rights appear to be coming to high school athletes. A Wake County judge in North Carolina ordered the state's Board of Education to implement NIL rules for high schoolers. Change won't happen overnight, but given how radically NIL revamped college sports, we should not underestimate the impact that this could eventually have in high school. The retirement of Adrian Wojnarowski has started a conversation about the exhausting life of a media insider. My next guest knows that all too well. Jordan Schultz is the NFL insider for Fox Sports, and we spoke about some of the sacrifices he has to make for his career and also hit on some of the big topics from this NFL season. I'm joined now by Jordan Schultz, NFL insider for Fox Sports, where he appears on The Herd with Callan Cowherd and Speak, also the host of the new show, Why is Dream Green Talking About Football with Jordan Schultz. Welcome, Jordan. Thank you, buddy. Good to, good to be here. Yeah, great to have you on. So um, the insider world was was rocked recently by Woj retiring from his you know long-term gig being that guy for, for ESPN, and we're starting to hear uh, not just basketball names, um, as a potential replacement for him, uh, you know, like Adam Schefter or Jeff Passan. Um, to what degree is being an insider a transferable skill between sports? I, I don't know how you can do both sports because it's so hard just to do one. You know, one of the biggest factors of the insider game is being obviously attached to your phone for contacts. Um, and that can be any different number of sources. But if you double that or triple that, depending on who, who you're talking to or what league you're covering, I find it to be nearly impossible. I mean, for context, I tried to do it early on as no one really told me it was impossible. And I thought I could do yeah, it. I could do at it. A, yeah. At a, yeah, I thought I could do it at a decent clip with the NBA and NFL. And it really, it's not, I can't stress enough how hard that would be or how I actually think that would be actually impossible. I really can't. Just because of the phone, of the time, and then just your brain, your mental brain space to be able to like think about each story and each source. It's already so hard with one sport and you know one league. I just I don't know how you could do it. Yeah, and, and take us inside the insider life, if you will. I mean like 
we've heard stories of like you know Woj. I don't know if this is like literally true, but him like having his phone sort of like visibly available like when he's taking a shower yep. like shams when he's on tv is like you know half the time he's looking yep. down at his phone is this just like a 24 7 kind of thing it is it really is um it's a labor of love and hate it really is uh i mean I, the, the, some of the stories that i've missed because i didn't have the phone it's like it, it can really hurt you it can haunt you because if you if you do if you do the work to get the story and then you get it, but you don't see it maybe because you didn't have your phone. Your phone was on silent. Uh, you left the room for a few minutes. These are all learning experiences. Everyone is different, though. For me, uh, having a young family, I I've come to the realization that there are going to be stories that I miss. And there are times when I put the phone down because I need to have a semblance of balance and normalcy in my life. Um, a lot of times when I put the kids down, we have two young kids, I'll put the phone away, which can be 30 or 45 minutes, um, sometimes an hour. And it's just something that I'm willing, it's a decision I've made, you know, and so I live with the results. I don't know if that's common, but it's just for me how I need to operate. But, you know, you get scared of having bad Wi-Fi. You go on a, I was on a flight last week from LA to New York where there was no Wi-Fi for like, you know, five and a half hours. And I actually was shocked I didn't miss anything, but there have been times where you are on a flight and the Wi-Fi is bad or it's slow or it doesn't work and you do miss stuff. Those are frustrating too, but this is just all part of it. Like nothing's ever going to be perfect. Yeah. How old are your kids? Our, our daughter is nine. Our son is seven, you know, and, and because of the travel now with, with Fox, I'm in LA and, and with Draymond every week for probably two days, basically. Like I'll go for usually two days and I'm leaving today. I'll come back late Friday night. So that's two and a half days. I mean, that's just part of it. So like when I'm home, I really want to be accessible to them. Another one of the hard parts for me, and even I think more challenging for them is that I do work from home a lot. So physically I'm here, but that doesn't necessarily mean emotionally I'm here. And during some of the really busy times, free agency, trade deadline, um, you know, like, I'm so locked in here that my wife actually will put up a sign, do not enter, daddy's working. And um, that that's when they know it's super serious. When, that's, when that sign is up on the office door, they know like, okay, we have to be quieter today. We can't come running in. Because there have been times where I've been on a show when my kids come running into the room and, you know, you're, you're balancing that. But like, that's this part of it, especially if you are working from home, which I think most people do you know you're, you're in studio but a lot of times you have a green screen or some kind of setup in your apartment or in your house but you're still technically at home yeah yeah i have kids that are four and eight i've been waiting for the the moment on this show where they they come running yeah. in and you know it's it like, happens man joining us live now um and yeah honestly that was my first thought when when i saw the Schefter news and with passing news like they, they've got kids right like i know passing does i think Schefter does yeah, it's adam, like adam has a, a one he has two kids and one daughter i think um in, in high school. So yeah, I mean, it's when, when, when Woe was retired and, and Adam came out and said what he said about the challenges of the job, I think a lot of people in the industry related to, to what he was saying. Yeah. I mean, is it a role where you think like there's, there's kind of a shelf life, you get burned out over, you know, however many years it takes. I think that clearly happened with, with, with Woj, you know, I mean, he was at the top of his game and that obviously was a, the ultimate bombshell that nobody really expected. I certainly didn't. Um, you, but that's why I try to balance it with the other components of life. Um, I don't know how everyone else does it, but for me, hoping not to get burnout, that's what I need. And um, I, I just, the best way to answer it is, I think like any job, there's great things about it and, and things that are, you wish were different. And you have to really stay attached to the things that you're that you enjoy the most, because when the when the frustrating or the things that don't go so well happen, those lows can be super low and you have to keep it in context. But I, for me, like getting burnt out is definitely on my mind. And that's why I try to balance it out. And how much of that, you know, like, oh, I missed a story because you know, I was on a flight or I was with my kids. Is missing a story just someone else got it first? Like, it's just the, the game of 
getting yeah, the sweep? It, it's it's a combination. Well, sometimes it's like you don't have your phone. Um, I, and I've had two or three just monsters where I didn't have the phone um, or it was on silent or I thought I didn't need it. And those are those. That's one. And then the other one is, yeah, someone else gets it first. That's that's usually that's much more common just because the volume of stories that happen throughout a day, a week, a month, a year, there's so many and everyone's chasing oftentimes the same story or the same agent or team. And as a result, um, realistically, like you're just not going to be able to get every story. There is always another one, though, which is, you know, a positive right. Yeah, yeah, the, the news never stops. Uh, I want to hit a couple of NFL topics while we got you. Yeah. Uh, Devontae Adams, at the time of recording, and this feels like one that could, you know, don't sure. don't leave your phone. But, um, it, um, y- you know, he's probably going to get traded uh, yeah. from the Raiders. Uh, it seems like just that, that relationship is... And so yeah. I guess my question is, is this one bad relationship or is this a franchise that is kind of a mess right now? It's a French. It's an owner that it's an owner that has not ever, and Mark Davis figured out, um, in my opinion, how to run a successful franchise. I'm not saying make money. I'm not talking about necessarily even wins and losses. I'm just talking about the culture of the franchise, and I don't think the Raiders have ever really had that under his ownership. Um, there are certain owners, James Dolan with the Knicks. Um, the ownership and in, in with the athletics that just don't understand how to value um, and build a franchise in terms of leadership, uh, culture. I thought the Raiders hire of Antonio Pierce was a terrific one and that was a great start. But um, the bottom line with that relationship is uh, it has run its course. I mean, I reported, you know, last year that Adams was really frustrated with how Vegas moved on from Derek Carr. That's a relationship that uh, he valued. And so, you know, it's one of the reasons why I think he would want to be in New Orleans. I reported last night he would want to be with the Jets. But there's also the finance. Only a certain amount of teams are going to be able to to handle that $17 million. So this, it'd be really hard for the Saints to do it. Um, that's a team that's been rumored. I've also just reported the Cowboys are not one of these teams. I saw a report saying they had reached out. No, they had not reached out. Um, the Cowboys are not. They couldn't afford Derrick Henry. They're not going to be able to pay Devontae Adams. So there's only a sp- certain amount of teams. The Jets, to me, are the team that I would love to see because of the relationship with Aaron. Then you have the Garrett Wilson. You have the, that one, too, is, would be special. But that relationship has has run its course. And um, I don't, I'd be really surprised, Owen, if, if he isn't traded. But... I don't know if it's imminent. I it wouldn't shock me if it was, but I think every every organization that's going to be interested in Devonte is going to have to, and the Raiders for that matter. You're, I, it's it's very possible that this thing gets closer to the trade deadline, and then you see a, you get a better sense of where you're at. Yeah, yeah, it makes it <clears throat> makes sense. So that could be an awkward few weeks leading up very. to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, another one that's like I almost feel like we've forgotten about it because it's just been sitting there seemingly in stasis for um and there's like his individual situation but i feel like in the nfl right now there's kind of this shifting line of players that are have a certain value that they think they have versus what the team thinks and you know that often leads to a holdout situation and i feel like last year that was running backs is running backs wanted mm-hmm. to get paid more Teams are like, eh, like we can find the next guy who's just about as good, you know, in the draft or wherever. Um, is that, and right now I feel like maybe it's like wide receivers and maybe linebackers, especially at the star level of them saying like, we want the mega contracts and teams saying you're good, but we don't want to just like blow out the bank for you necessarily. Yeah. The, yeah, the position, the positions that have been devalued the most, um, running back, I'd say uh, linebacker safety it's it's hard for safeties to get paid we've seen a couple get paid McKinney and Green Bay got got a great deal Winfield and, and Tampa um but in general those are the positions I mean even corners have struggled to get paid uh receivers at the top end are getting huge deals but um that's really at the top so someone like Hassan Reddick who you know I I reported on it a lot and and he's I, He's a really prideful guy, and the context of that situation is super important. 
When I reported he requested a trade, a lot of people came at me and came at Hassan saying, why would he do that from the Jets? He just got traded. The, the context is essential. When the Eagles traded him to New York, before that trade even happened, the Jets offered him a below market deal. When that happened, sorry, I just got a text. See, this is what happens. <laughs> okay, that the text can wait a few minutes. Okay, this one can um, wait. Yeah, but but uh, but that that's the right. This is the life. Conversation yeah. and like you know, you know, uh, my son's hockey game, and I don't. I have the phone on silent, but I'm still checking it every like 20 minutes, and I had to leave the game for five minutes to take a call that. You know, I just wish I didn't have to take, but whatever. Um, anyways, when it, when it comes to Reddick, when when he's with the, the the Eagles, there's a below market. But before he's traded, the Eagles gave the Jets permission to negotiate, and they offered him a below market deal. He says no. Then they make the trade anyway. He's traded to the Jets. They tell him if you show up to your press conference, you know, the day after. This is like March 30th. We'll negotiate in good faith, and we'll get you the deal that you that you covet. They hadn't. They really haven't talked since then, and you're talking like six, seven months now. So the, Hassan Reddick, in my opinion, has every right to be as angry as he is, and and he is losing a lot of money. Obviously, eight hundred thousand a week in a game check. He accrued a ton of fines. I think he's over, well over six million now, in, in, in money that he's he's forfeited. Um, so that one's a, a tough situation, and you know it's certainly possible that the Jets could trade him. I, I don't, I don't know if. I don't know if I see that happening, but it's, it is possible. But, yeah, I mean, this is like the type of thing that happens when you tell a player something, and this is what I talk about building a culture. Um, you, you tell a player something and then you, you renege on your word. I mean, it, it just doesn't sit well with a lot of, with a lot of guys. Mm -hmm. And before we let you go, is there any kind of like story, narrative, trend that you see kind of creeping up now? Maybe we're not talking about it so much, but like whether it's like, turf or injuries or you know another position that that is like you know could go up or down yeah. or young quarterbacks what, what's kind of the like like dun, the two, dun, dun, yeah, dun. I'll give you, what's coming I'll, I'll give you two the, you mentioned turf i the brazil game was was the turf was horrendous George where jordan love got hurt a lot of guys were slipping i mean it was like the nfl to me can't put their guys in this position they, they talk about growing the game and how important it is globally to do it. I think it's awesome. They're playing games in Germany, all over Europe, South America now. That is so cool. You have to have a quality field. I mean, it's already bad enough that you still have really bad fields domestically. You know, MetLife has turf. Guys get hurt all the time on that field. And, and you hear it from players saying, I don't feel safe playing on the surface. Um, it's so frustrating, even as a fan. I'm a fan first. We all are to see guys get hurt because the, the product is not as good. Then you see guys getting hurt, which affects your teams. It just it's not acceptable. The NFL is just a multi billion dollar corporation. So to have bad fields um, when you have so much time to prepare for it, I, I don't understand that. And then the second thing um, is the fines that oftentimes happen on a Saturday, but then a player wasn't let's say a player uh, what there was a flag that was not enforced on a on a previous sunday but then you hear six days later they're fined 25,000 on a saturday a lot of players are really frustrated with that because it's not enforced during the game and then on a saturday like during college football when nobody's really paying attention to the nfl it's like the one day nobody really locks in on on the nfl you see like a barrage a dozen fines laid out 50,000 10,000 25,000 I don't get that either. If it's not called during the game, why are we then six days later on College Football Saturday burying it there? Those are the two things that, to me, as a fan first, are, are really frustrating. And I think the league needs to certainly look at. Jordan Schultz, really appreciate the insights. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. No, no, no problem. And no, you, you can bank it. You can block this out. There's no way. Me or I don't I don't see how anybody else Owen could be a multi-sport insider. That would be so unbelievably hard. So uh, at least for me, I, I I you don't have to worry about that. I'll be sticking to the NFL. It's it's not in my skill set. Right. I don't have that ability. Yeah, and you know there are other things in life than getting all the scoops. So there are there are like yeah. hanging out with you. Thanks for having me. Exactly. But yeah. Thanks for coming on.
MLB broadcasts are set for major change after Diamond Sports Group, which broadcast a dozen teams this season, said it will go down to one, the Atlanta Braves, in 2025. My colleague Eric Fisher has all the details about what's happening and what it means, and he joins us next. Joined now by Front Office Sports newsletter writer Eric Fisher. Welcome, Eric. Hello. Great to have you back on. Uh, big changes in the MLB landscape, right, as the playoffs are beginning. So Diamond Sports Group said it will go from broadcasting 12 teams, which they did this most recent season, down to just the Atlanta Braves. Um, to start with those other 11 teams, what does this mean for them? So unless they are willing to come back to Diamond at dramatically reduced terms, uh, they're on their own. And so they, they've got sort of two other primary buckets that they can look at. They can go to the league and have them stand up and produce and distribute their games as MLB is now doing for the Diamondbacks, Padres, and Rockies. Or they can go out on their own and look for an over-the-air-based uh, solution, similar to what we've seen with a growing number of NBA and NHL teams. Yeah, this feels like and baseball hasn't taken that plunge yet of the over the air plus streaming setup, but this feels like probably but it's, it's been coming even before today's court action uh the rangers and the twins which had expiring uh contracts with diamond were already uh considering in that uh looking in that direction particularly the rangers uh so yes today is definitely a dramatic step forward but we've been in within baseball sort of pushing in this direction already uh because they were never going to be in a completely different place in this area than are the nba and nhl and is it safe to say that the reason Diamond is hanging on to the Braves and not any of the other teams who they were still under contract with, I believe it was seven of those teams they had a, con a 2025 contract with, they're keeping the Braves because they like the Braves deal? Yeah, the Braves deal is it really kind of works for both sides that uh, is economically feasible for Diamond, but also provides a good battery of revenue for the team. It draws well. The Braves are a popular team. They're good every year. They have all their key players locked up well into the next decade. Uh, so they're pretty much guaranteed that for the next really five to 10 years, the Braves are going to be a consistently competitive club. Uh, so there's just a lot of certainty there in a situation that is is just rife with uncertainty. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, where does this leave Diamond? I and mean, they still have some NBA and NHL contracts, but it yes. seems like they're going to be out of the MLB game before too long. Yeah, so we're still heading towards a uh, intended uh, confirmation hearing beginning the middle of November, uh, in which the company will look to have its reorganization plan formally approved by the court. They've still got these two dozen uh, combined uh, teams across the NHL and uh, NBA that they're they're at least going for through the rest of the 24-25 season under revised terms for 25, 26 and beyond, we'll have to see. Uh, but the immediate term over the next six weeks is getting is for D uh, Diamond Sports Group to get to that confirmation uh, hearing. And so over the upcoming weeks, we're going to have uh, a number of filings that will sort of detail the sort of last revision of that reorganization plan. And any of the involved stakeholders, whether it be people who hold Diamond's debt or any of these leagues that we've been talking about, they'll have an opportunity to weigh in as well. And there, we could see some formal objections to the reorganization. Gotcha. Um, as you've been writing about, MLB wants to nationalize its local broadcast. You probably can't have all of them, but wants to have a you know a critical mass of yes. teams all under one broadcasting umbrella. What does this do for that quest? This definitely accelerates it, perhaps even quicker than uh, what they were looking to do because uh, they were talking about being sandbagged in court today that they didn't expect that there, this sort of bomb was going to be dropped in terms of all these teams being cut loose uh, all at once and so soon. Uh, but this definitely sort of accelerates that plan that over time, uh, Rob Manford, the commissioner, and the rest of the league would like to see something that looks a little bit more like the nationalized uh, NFL media plan. That's a lot easier said than done. We've got a ton of games. There's a lot of inventory to split up. And, of course, the big question is how does the revenue flow uh, between the teams in terms of – because you're talking about a fundamental reconstruction of how revenue sharing works. And then what does that do in the player market? Uh, you know, and 
are we looking at the same size of the sport economically in the aggregate as we do now? At least in the short term, it looks like we could be looking at some kind of dip, but how do they come out on the other side of this? So a lot of big questions that have yet to be answered. Yeah. And one of those for me is just what this looks like. I mean, I can imagine a streaming service that's like MLB TV, but you also get your your local market, um, at least for the markets involved. Would there be like an over the air or even a cable component that would go with that? Sure. Uh, basically, what they're trying to create is just kind of a frictionless service, whether it be over the air streaming all of the above, you know, cable, direct TV type people, especially now that they're buying Dish to opt into this, where a fan can just turn on the game and get it. And between the different outlets that already carry the games and the blackout restrictions, it's very confusing right now. And there's sort of a lot of barriers to entry in terms of finding a game and then actually being able to access the game. This actually, op, you know, again, there's a lot of hard work to be done, and this is going to really take years, plural, to unfold. But there's an opportunity here to reduce a lot of those uh, pain points for fans. And that's one of the things I'm actually – encouraged about is that if we could have a fundamental reconstruction of the map and just make it easy for the fan, just be able to watch the game, uh, that could be a really good outcome on the other side of this. Yeah, absolutely. And this, you know, whether or not MLB wanted it all at once, probably a good thing that they're getting it. Um, it's, other than, you know, the, the court details that you, you went through earlier, what other dominoes are you looking for in terms of next steps here? Well, just really looking to see where the where the big market clubs that are not part of this, how do they sort of feel about this? That you've got the Yankees, the Mets, the Red Sox, the Dodgers, the Cubs that either have massive rights deals outside of the Diamond Arena or just own their own RSNs outright. As this sort of new model begins to uh, emerge in both the near term and the long term, how do they sort of fold into this? And I mentioned before, sort of getting clubs to sort of buy into a new thinking on revenue sharing. That's really going to be part of this. And, uh, you know, if Rob Manford gets a critical mass of clubs and can really put together a really interesting package based around X number of teams, how do those big market clubs that had you know, have already got their own situations. How do they fold in here? It's a really big question. Yeah, absolutely. And one that might not be resolved for years. Um, yeah. Eric Fisher, thanks so much for joining us. Always a pleasure. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. As if college football hasn't undergone enough change in the recent weeks, a new contender for a craziest realignment scenario has entered the fray. On Tuesday, a group of prominent college sports leaders unveiled a detailed proposal that would reclassify all 136 FBS schools under one Super League, but divide it into two conferences, the Power 12, featuring 72 schools, and the Group of Eight, which will house the remaining 64. Each of those would be divided into regional divisions. As a part of this proposed new structure, year-to-year -year relegation and promotion will be introduced into the college landscape. The Power 12 would be the premier conference, but group of eight schools would be able to move up into the Power 12 based on a strong season of play, and Power 12 schools could be relegated to the group of eight. Every season would end with a 24-team college football playoff. This would likely have to wait until each conference's media deal runs out, not to mention that some of those conferences are doing quite well with the status quo. But putting all that aside, this might be a much better system. College football should strive to reach a logical organization, not one dictated by individual media deals. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, share it with someone who would like it too and throw us some love on whatever platform you use to tune in. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.